Good evening. Could I invite you to stand while Tony Ann Foster comes and leads us in the singing of the national anthem and the national song, please. Thank you, Tony Ann. Baroness Scotland, Your Excellency and Mrs. Taylor, Honorable Chief Justice Anthony Smelly, the Right Honorable Sir John Chadwick, President of the Court of Appeals, Honorable Franz Manderson, Deputy Governor, Ministers of the Cabinet, Chief Officers, University College Board of Governors, President Roy Barden, other distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a pleasure to see so many that made it possible to be here this evening for this second in a series of distinguished lectures leading up to this university's 2014 conference. I almost said annual, but it is now becoming biannual. 
This is the second in that series of distinguished lectures, and the final one will be held in November, and it is a fitting run-up to what will be an extremely exciting and dynamic conference uh, on a topic that affects us all, whether we like to acknowledge it or not. Now to do the formal welcome this evening, I'm going to call on Mr. Orrin Merrin, a former member of the Board of Governors, who he tells me is filling in this evening for his son, Mr. Orrin Merrin. Thank you, Master of Ceremonies. And the protocol having been established, I won't detain you with relisting all the names. But it is a privilege to be here tonight to be able to give the welcome for our beloved Madam Chair, Mrs. Berna Murphy Cummings, who is in Maine. I believe that is where she has a summer residence and she's having a little R&R. &R. We in Cayman sometimes refer to north as being down north, so Miss Berna headed down north, kept going until she got to down Maine. And I think some of you may know that they refer to Maine as down Maine. Why? I don't know. But as our Master of Ceremonies said, I'm filling in for my son who is in Little Cayman and was unable to be here. But since I am the fill-in for a fill-in, I'm still going to welcome all of you tonight. When I was on the Board of Governors, Madam Chair often called on me to fill in for her, so I'm happy to do it again on this occasion. We are greatly honored tonight to have Barna Scotland share with us on this very important topic. As you may know, Barna Scotland has her roots in the Caribbean, having been born in Dominica, a country that also produced Dame Eugenia Charles, the Caribbean's first female prime minister. Tonight, we have a most distinguished lady to deliver this most distinguished lecture. I was speaking with Baroness Scotland briefly before the program started, and I was sad to hear that they're overworking her. They had radio interviews in one um, meeting after the next lined up for her. As we say down here, Baroness Scotland, when you find a good horse, you keep riding it. And uh, they obviously know your worth and they want to include you in everything. But she would like to enjoy some of our amenities like Stingray City and West Bay Beach. So hopefully, Mr. Roy, we can fit some of that in for her as well. Because we don't want to just tell her she's welcome, we want to make her welcome and experience a true Caymanian welcome. So without further ado, we are honored here tonight to have you, Baroness Scotland. We salute you for all that you have accomplished, for who you are, and what you stand for in so many worthy fields of pursuit. Now I'll turn it back to our Master of Ceremonies. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Orin. And now it's my pleasure to call on Dr. Livingston Smith, the Chair of Social Sciences, the Director of Research and Publication, as well as the Chairman of the Conference Committee. This gentleman, in addition to carrying his full load as a faculty and a lecturer, carries an awesome responsibility in leading us in the planning of our conferences. It is a task that really ought to be dedicated full time. And he manages somehow to fit it in, I suppose by getting up very early and staying up very late. I won't ask him to tell us the secret. But here he is to tell us a little bit about the conference series, Dr. Livingston Smith.
Mr. Master of Ceremonies, ladies and gentlemen. The distinguished lecture series came out of the belief of the university administration that the university must be the center of intellectual thought, carefully and systematically deliberating on relevant and critical issues. A main objective of this series, therefore, is to facilitate presentations that represent penetrating, rigorous, deep, and novel interpretations of important issues and themes relevant to the socio psychology, history, culture, and economics of the Cayman Islands, the region, and indeed internationally. It is fitting that we should come together to deliberate on ethical issues. The fact is that there is near universal consensus that the effects of unethical conduct, whether in the private or public sectors, are truly multiple and interconnected, negatively impacting the political, economic, sociocultural, and environmental sectors of societies. Out of an awareness of this, the theme of the March 19 to 21st, 2014 International Caribbean Conference is toward a corruption-free Caribbean, ethics, values, trust, and morality. These lectures are a build-up to this event and are meant to whet your intellectual appetites. In the first lecture, as you know, Professor Monroe gave a riveting presentation on corruption in the Caribbean, where to from here. I want to let you know that copies of the DVD are available for sale this evening for just $10. The lecture can also be accessed on the conference website and I want to encourage each person here to visit the website. It's www.uccaconference.ky. That lecture is also on YouTube. As you've heard, on Thursday evening, November 14, Jock Blum, one of the US's leading white collar defense attorneys, will end this series with a lecture on corruption in the private sector. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to say that the plans for the 2014 conference are proceeding well. UCCI is partnering with Carleton University's Center on Values and Ethics, the University of the West Indies Department of Government, MONA, the University of Technology, Northern Caribbean University, and the National Integrity Action, Jamaica, the Transparency Institutes of Trinidad and Guyana, the Conference of Seventh-day Adventist Cayman Islands in staging this conference. And we do expect that the list of partners will keep growing. Plenaries, roundtables, and concurrent paper presentations are being organized covering the state of political corruption in the Caribbean, the teaching of values and ethics, the role of the church, models of anti-corruption institutions, the media, academic and professional ethics, NGOs fighting corruption, to name a few. Now, I have good news this evening. The good news is that each of you here can pre-register for this conference at a 20% discount. And I want to say to you, right on your, on your seats, there are forms. Um, I want to urge you to take a minute to fill out these forms so that you can be seen as pre-registered for this conference. You can pay now or you can pay nearer to the event. I urge you also to consider even becoming more involved. We need supporters um, in cash and kind. We need volunteers to help with planning and the execution of conference activities. We need as many persons to write and present um, papers. 
And for our students, we, we want them also to enter the essay competition. We have made available the call for papers, and Lem and I uh, look forward to speaking with you and hearing from you. Finally, the University College, though in the main a teaching institution, as director of research and publication, I must say that the university fully understands the vibrant nexus between excellence in teaching and commitment to research and publication. This explains why the university publishes its own peer review journal. I'm sure you'll find the most recent publication of the Journal of the University College of the Cayman Islands worthy of purchase. Copies are available this evening for only $10. Under the theme, The Changing Nature of Educational Leadership, you'll find papers from scholars in the Cayman Islands, the broader Caribbean, and international. For example, from the Cayman Islands, Dr. the Honorable Linford Pearson, himself a strong supporter of research and publication at UCCI, has a paper drawn from his PhD dissertation entitled, Educational Leadership Approaches to Improve School Preparedness of Children with Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, ADHD, and Dr. Joe Wood of the Ministry of Education has a paper entitled, Education Reform, Building an Infrastructure for Raising Standards and Improving the Quality of Provision in the Cayman Islands. You might even desire to publish a paper with Juicy. The next issue, the Caymanian Landscape Change and Continuity. Submission details can be found on the university website on the research and publication. Ladies and gentlemen, I also welcome you and wish for you a great evening and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Livingston. And now the moment that we've been waiting for. It's my great pleasure to invite the Deputy Governor, the Honorable Franz Mandison, to come and introduce our guest lecturer this evening. Good evening, everyone. I know protocol has been established, but it would be remiss of me if I didn't acknowledge my boss and governor for the next eight days. But my friend forever, His Excellency the Governor, Mr. Taylor, and of course, our distinguished lecturer, Ms. Mrs. Barnes, Scotland. As Deputy Governor and Head of the Civil Service, I get many tasks. Some are good and not so good, but on occasion, you get to do something which is exceptional, and that's the duty that I have tonight in to introduce um, Ms. Barnett Scotland QC. Barnett Scotland, many accomplishments and achievements have been provided to you in, in a leaflet that you have and is world renowned. You'll have seen that in 1991, at the age of 35, she became the first black and youngest woman ever to be appointed Queen's Council and the youngest person to be so appointed since Pitt the Younger. From 1999 to, to 2001, she was a parli parliamentarian under Secretary of State at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, where she was responsible for North America, the Caribbean, Overseas Territories, Council Division, British Council, Administration, and all parliamentary business in the Lords, where she established, among other things, a forced marriage unit. It was during that time that she met His Excellency Governor Taylor, and they have had a long-lasting relationship ever since. They've been great friends. I have spoken to Governor Taylor about, about his working relationship with Barnard of Scotland, and he recalls how she helped him in his role as Head of Consular Affairs, especially when dealing with families who have lost loved ones, and how he was struck by her ability to calm persons who were suffering great loss, and how caring and compassionate she was. It certainly made his job a lot easier, and if you think about trying to console someone who has lost a, a, 
a young a, a loved one how difficult that is when you know the person but of course in these situations the persons were not known to her but yet she was able to provide them much needed comfort ladies and gentlemen i have just mentioned a few about his Scotland's accomplishments which like i said is well known what is not so well known is that she achieved all of this under very difficult circumstances born in dominica the daughter of a police officer and one of 12 children was how her life began. Her parents moved the family to the UK to ensure access to quality education for their children. During her childhood, Barnes Scotland indeed endured racial prejudice but was never deterred. Her guidance counselor suggested that she should apply for a job in a local supermarket. Needless to say, she didn't accept that advice. In fact, in 2007, she was appointed as Attorney General for the England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. How wrong that guidance counselor was. After the, con after the conclusion of, of the Northern Ireland Agreement, she was appointed as Advocate General for Northern Ireland. As Attorney General, she was the Chief Legal Advisor to Her Majesty the Queen, Parliament, and the Government, Supervisor and Superintendent of the Prosecutorial Service Authorities, leader of the bar, and had a non-statutory oversight of the prosecutors in government's departments, the Treasury Solicitor's Department, and the Armed Service Prosecuting Authority. She was guardian of the rule of law and public interest. She was one of the three cabinet ministers responsible for, criminal, for the criminal justice system and had a specific responsibility for fraud policy and the National Fra Fraud Authority, and chaired the interministerial group responsible for the improvement of the response to fraud and e-crime. Uniquely qualified to speak on tonight's topic, anti-corruption work, anti sorry, anti-corruption commissions that work, and examination of successful reg regimes, Barnet Scotland has led sustained efforts to reform the laws on corruption. She has helped shape the Fraud Act 2006 and as Attorney General, she became a government authority on e-fraud and corruption. This led to the eventual creation of the Bribery Act 2010. In 2009, she was presented with an award for her work on anti-corruption at the UN conference in Doha. I've had the privilege to meet Barnett Scotland on two occasions. One such occasion was uh, today at Cabinet, when we have the privilege of asking her to join us for lunch. And we were impressed with the breadth of knowledge and the passion, her passion, I want to say that again, her passion for uh, the topics that she spoke to us about. And in a few minutes, you will share that passion and experience that passion. On a lighter note, I can say that Brown of Scotland is a true Caribbean woman. She enjoys her cricket. And I understand that one of her favorite songs is Get Up, Stand Up by Bob Marley. Are we surprised? Uh, she also has a great sense of humor, uh, which I witnessed today. Uh, she told us a story how she was able to keep up with the cricket scores during uh, Parliament when no electronic uh, devices was uh, uh, being allowed in the chamber, but she managed to get the scores in. How I won't, I won't uh, tell you how she did it, but uh, that's her sec our secret. Barnett Scotland is the patron of the Corporate Alliance Against Domestic Violence, and she's very passionate about, about that, and she's been on the radio speaking about domestic violence. She's a joint patron of, of Mission, a charity which is the Catholic Church Official Support Organization for Overseas Mission. She's also a patron of the Children's Charity, Children and Families Across Borders, a charity dedicated to reuniting children who have been separated from their families. In Cayman, she is a member of the Judicial and Legal Service Commissions, and maybe in, in another few months we'll, we'll convince her to do something else here in, here in Cayman. We are delighted to have Barnett Scotland with us this evening and look forward to what I'm sure will be a, a very engaging and informative lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, is, we are really truly honored this evening to have Barnett Scotland with us, and I would invite you to join me in welcoming her to, to the podium. Thank you.
Well, firstly, I'd like to say thank you for the warmth of that welcome. For me, as many of you will know, this feels very much like coming home. I am indeed a child of the Caribbean, born in the most beautiful but perfectly formed island of Dominica. 365 rivers, one for every day. And it is said that it is the only island in the Caribbean Sea that Columbus would still recognize. <laughs> because nothing has changed. Uh, but much has, of course, changed here in Cayman, much of it good. As you have been told, I have a long association with the Caribbean and the overseas territories. And indeed, it was my great privilege to be minister responsible for the overseas territories between 1999 and 2001, where I was able to institute the consultative council, which is still here today, although in a slightly different form. But I want to particularly say a very warm thank you to the Board of Governors, the President, the faculty staff, and actually most importantly, the students of the University of the College of, uh, the, of, the University of, of Cayman. And I say particularly to the students because they are our future. I hope many of those students will be lawyers. I don't know whether any of them are here, and whether they could indicate to me how many of you are potential lawyers. Thank God, I have four women on the right. I just want to say to you ladies in particular, having been the first female attorney general in the United Kingdom in 700 years, I really don't want to be the last. But I am uh, particularly pleased to be able to talk to you about a subject which is of growing importance and proud, therefore, that I have been chosen to be the second of the three speakers that will be addressing the very important and now internationally uh, 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 recognized problem of uh, corruption. As I say, it's always a, a particular delight for me to come to the Caribbean. But this is an issue which is affecting not just this region, but every region across the world. And corruption is something, therefore, which, in my view, is absolutely everyone's business, and not just those who deal with um, corruption on a day-to-day -day basis. The global downturn that took place in 2008 caused a dramatic change. <laughs> Private capital, which is available for investment, found it difficult to find safe places to go. Security is now high amongst the priorities for most investors. The impact on public procurement has been less dramatic, and public international bodies are still able to invest globally but the international funder organizations, that's the UNDP, the Council of Europe, the European Union, the African Union, the A2 African Development Bank, the World Bank, all now require a high standard of probity from the countries they invest in. And the reverse is also true. Countries and private entities are increasing, increasingly excluded from bidding for contracts if they do not adhere to the highest financial standards. So globalization has led to the growth of companies with bigger gross national uh, products than some countries. The international tax system has struggled to keep up. The loopholes in the system are now being exploited by many large corporations, which is causing consternation across the world. Licensing agreements, whereby corporations create a subsidiary in a low tax jurisdiction, which then licenses back the brand 
to the parent company for a small fee have been used as a means of limiting company tax liabilities, and countries face increasing problems from below. In meeting the needs of their populations, primarily using tax revenues and pressures from above in having to attract investment from multinationals. And the two pressures are interdependent, but do not sit happily together. Uh, many of you all know that my own party, the Labour Party, has made clear its commitment to international corporate transparency. Even now, there are discussions as to whether we should consider making all multinational corporations operating in the United Kingdom to publish details of any tax schemes they may be using globally and also to publish information about the ownership of companies situated in the territories, which can then be assessed by HMRC in the UK. And considerations of such policies are part of an increasing recognition that global corporations have a responsibility to pay tax in the countries where they create such vast profits. And consumers, too, are likely to become more attuned to these issues in the choices they make. And many of you will have seen the impact that has already occurred in terms of the way in which many consumers are responding to companies like Starbucks. They're being pressured and challenged. And an imperative for international fund organizations is that the money they invest is not frittered away by corruption. There's in, an increasing awareness of the global impact of corruption. The World Bank has estimated that a trillion dollars are paid in bribes each year, and that corruption drags economic growth figures down by between 0.5 and 1%. And in addition, the World Bank estimates that between 20 and 40% of the official development assistance is simply lost in corruption. And in 2003, the UN Convention Against Corruption, the UNCAC, was adopted by the UN General Assembly, and it was signed by the United Kingdom on the 9th of December 2003 and ratified on the 9th of February 2006. But it is only currently extended to the British Virgin Islands of the overseas territories. And the UNCAC is an attempt, an attempt, to create internationally accepted standards of probity for public servants, such as establishing codes of conduct, requirements for financial and other disclosures, and appropriate disciplinary measures. And the UNCAC also requires countries to establish criminal offenses to cover a wide range of acts. But the conve convention goes beyond any of the previous instruments of this kind by criminalizing not only basic forms of corruption, such as bribery and the embezzlement of public funds, but also trading in influence and the concealment and laundering of the proceeds of corruption. It's ambitious in its scope, but it presently represents an aspiration rather than an effective international instrument. And at the G20 in 2010 in Toronto, leaders of the G20 countries agreed to accede to or ratify and effectively implement the convention. And a further list of commitments were agreed. But adopting and enforcing laws against the bribery of foreign officials and to create a framework for asset recovery and extradition has to be more than an aspiration. States are also signing up in greater numbers to the OECD Convention on Combating Bribery Foreign Officials uh, in International Business. And the convention entered into force in 1999 but presently, Cayman is the only territory which has ratified it. And prior to the Bribery Act's passage through Parliament in 2010, many of you will remember that the United Kingdom itself 
was censored by the OECD for its purported lack of compliance with the Convention. Now, the Bribery Act, which I hope we'll discuss in a little detail later, has now raised the United Kingdom to the status of a leading player in the fight against corruption. And although the global effectiveness of the OECD Convention is limited, particularly in the overseas territories, again, it illustrates that the issue is increasingly important on the global agenda. So indeed, those two issues of tax avoidance and corruption are coming to be seen as symptoms of the same problem. The inability of nation states, in particular small nations, to tackle the excesses of globalization. And offshore centers have been seen in some quarters as vulnerable destinations for the proceeds of corruption as well as low tax jurisdictions. And that is a perception which the territories need to deal with head on. The overseas territories have changed greatly. Everyone in this room knows that the Cayman Islands, BVI and Bermuda have, as is well known, developed rapidly from largely maritime and tourist-based economies to become some of the world's leading financial centers. The territories as a whole should be proud of this international status. The Cayman Islands is now the world's fifth largest financial service center. Since the mid-1980s, BVI has become a center for offshore company registration. It has strong links, in particular, with the US and the Asia-Pacific region. And by the end of 2011, more than 450,000 companies were registered in the BVI. And Bermuda, like Cayman Islands, is a strong player in the reinsurance market, which has expanded significantly since the 11th of September 2001. And again, after Hurricane Katrina, Rita, and Wilma, in 2005, and Bermuda now ranks with Lloyds of London and New York as a global leader in the reinsurance market. And it's the third largest reinsurance center in the world and the second largest captive insurance center. And it has consistently had one of the highest per capita GDPs in the world. And the strength of financial sector has led to the relative decrease in the importance of tourism to the economy. And the important role which Cayman Islands, BVI, and Bermuda play in the global economy is now widely recognized. And they are all members of the Financial Stability Board's regional group for the Americas. Bermuda, as vice chair, hosted the second meeting of the Global Forum on Transparency and Exchange of Information for Tax Purposes in 2011. So cutting edge. So anyone who tells you that the people of this region are not amongst the very best in the world, I hope you will be able to disabuse them of that fact. So it's important, I think, for us to recognize that the region has changed and dramatically in the last 30 or 40 years, in many ways for the better. Economic growth, technological advancement, academic and cultural recognition of the multifaceted talents of the peoples of these islands, which are nestled within the Caribbean Sea and its neighboring waters, has all been firmly established. But the challenges presented to a sophisticated and diverse democracy are present too. Cayman is no exception. For those territories which have remained within the British family, partnership has remained the watchword and the model. But what that partnership means to each partner has created a new paradigm, which has not always been easy to navigate. The overseas territories have reached a turning point, And this has been said many times in their respective histories. 
But this turning point is somewhat different to those that have come before because of the importance of the choices which the territories now face. The new challenges are all too real. Not least of them is corruption. Internationally, corruption can take many forms, but its consequence, wherever it arises, always appears to be the same. It creates division and undermines confidence in the public. It is present when the rule of law is absent, and in every democracy, it has to be eradicated because failure to do so brings about real destruction of the citizens' quality of life, their sense of fairness, parity of treatment, belief in justice, and undermines community, sometimes, as in the case of the Arab Spring countries, fatally. Every instrument available needs to be used to combat it, and aggressively. It is everyone's business and should never be seen nor left as the preserve of the political or institutional elite. No matter how gifted, fiscally competent, or well-intentioned, creating a culture which is resistant to bribery and corruption needs a multi-layered and multidisciplinary approach where every participant understands the impact of their acceptance or toleration of the corrupt practices of those who may surround them, and that silence is collusion. It's a hard message, and one which is often unpalatable to many, who, innocent themselves of poor practice, would rather look the other way, because challenge and confrontation is too difficult to contemplate. So I think I should make plain straight away that an anti-corruption commission, no matter how well structured and able, cannot be and should never be seen as a panacea. Such commissions should rather be seen as potential instruments or vehicles for targeted change and scrutiny, but only as part of the tapestry of things which need to be in place if good governance is to prevail and corruption addressed and hopefully prevented. The trillion dollar global financial cost of corruption means that organized criminals and the crime they commit are becoming ever more ingenious in nature and deviant pushing boundaries, aided by technology, which has proved to be capable of several different uses, and not all of them good. Technology can shield wrongdoing as easily as it can be used as a sword to pierce the veil behind which the corrupt hide. Money is at the heart of organized crime. The lifestyle and status it brings is the main motivation for most criminals and those who engage uh, in the most part in corrupt practices too, because there's not a great deal of difference between the two. And just as legitimate businesses need funding to stay afloat, so does organized crime. Without cash flow, deals can't be made and people can't be paid. For both these reasons, many organized criminals fear attacks on their finances and lifestyle more than going to prison, which many people just see as the necessary tax you have to pay for the assets that you secure. So asset recovery has become key to defeating the criminals or the corrupt who seek to encase themselves in lawfare and whose assets like that of global businesses can rival the gross national product 
of many developed states. And the legislation created to enable law enforcement officers to pursue these ill-gotten gains has become one of the most important tools in the toolkit available to fight and hopefully eventually prevent corruption. In the United Kingdom, Soccer, which is a serious organized crime agency, uses the proceeds of Crime Act 2002 and the Serious Organized Crime and Police Act 2005 to make it more difficult for criminals to get their hands on their money and launder the profits of their crimes. They do this by the use of civil recovery proceedings in the High Court, freezing assets, ta making tax assessments, confiscation orders in the Crown Court, and forfeiture orders in the Magistrates' Court, which can permit the police to make cash seizures and forfeit uh, applications so that soccer can take cash from people where there is no legitimate reason uh, for them to possess it. And these processes, although they can be slow, painfully difficult, but ultimately hugely successful as interlocutors across the globe link arms to provide the information and evidence needed to bring the corrupt to book. And also, frankly, the public love it. I'll just give you a little example of what happened in Kent. There was a very well-known criminal family who had the most fantastic assets. They had a boat, they had a Maserati, they had a number of different cars. And everyone in the whole area knew that they were criminals, but they were seen as untouchable. Well, the Kent police were very successful in firstly prosecuting them, and secondly, relieving them of the burden of their assets. <laughs> and one of the things they did is they painted, and I believe it was the Maserati, but forgive me if it was um, the Bentley, on the side, donated to the police force of Kent by the kind offices of, and then they emblazoned the name of the criminal. Everybody knew as a result, what happens when you get caught? Two things, we need to catch them, we need to put them away, but we need most importantly to relieve them of their assets. So asset recovery is a very powerful tool in the toolkit for those who wish to fight the corrupt, because you can relieve them like Robin Hood and give it back to the poor. But time is of the essence, and time has really concertinaed, and speed has become increasingly important. Real time now is counted in seconds. Transactions which in the past would have taken months have now been reduced in time, not just to weeks, days, or even hours, but to seconds. And the globalized world now keeps global time. And transactions commenced in Australia are continued by London, the Middle East, Turkey, China, and elsewhere. Deals, both legitimate and illegitimate, now cross time zones, involve multidisciplinary teams, the international has become the norm, and the global is no longer the exception, but has now become the expectation. So the challenges this new world presents are really immense, as are the rewards, opportunities, and the dangers. Risk assessment is the new 24-hour interconnected world of finance and criminal opportunity, a really complex thing to undertake, and it is really not for the faint-hearted. The race is certainly on, but who will win? The well-regulated market's integrity is being challenged as never before. Investors are looking for clean, safe markets in which to invest, where the corruption tax 
is not present and where safe but good returns are possible and the risks to their capital are low. Events which led to the financial tsunami that swept across markets from 2008 have left an indelible mark on the public's consciousness. Trust is at a premium, and bankers, regulators, and politicians have felt the cold wind of the public's disapproval. The disconnect which arose between risk and reward, responsibility, has left a legacy which is difficult to deal with. Historically, city bankers were always characterized as overly cautious, conservative, prudent, slightly unadventurous, bordering on the boring. That has really changed. Because then came the physicists, the pure mathematicians, who developed mathematical theories which were peddled by those who perhaps didn't quite understand that these were hypotheses, just mental, intellectually exciting mathematical gymnastics, making figures do amazing things, creating profits and products and margins which were extraordinary, ethereal, but not based in reality. Products which these ingenious physicists and mathematicians created were not really meant to be bought, sold, and or traded. It was all ideas, probabilities, not really products. But people became overly excited by the opportunities. They traded in these fantastical ideas. And over time, the erstwhile prudent, careful, cautious bankers became seduced and now are, even now, often, all too often, seen as not investors in real products and people, but as the harbingers of irresponsibility. And this characterization is not entirely fair or accurate, but it is our new reality. And what always surprises me is nobody ever criticizes the physicists or the mathematicians. In the West, this disconnect between risk and reward allowed the traders to forget their true purpose, a corruption of sorts, which ate away at the very basis of our financial system and brought it to the brink of collapse. Just as in the East, the Arab Spring was the response to the level of corruption which was created by the absence of the rule of law. As many of you will remember, the Arab Spring started in Tunisia when a young fruit seller, frustrated by his inability to secure a license to sell fruit, unable due to the corruption endemic in the system to secure redress through the police, courts, or the administration, in an act of utter hopelessness and desperation, set himself alight in the town square. It was the turning point when the Tunisian people decided that they could no longer bear to suffer under the yoke of such corrosive and stifling corruption and that things had to change. The hunger for the rule of law was such that it could no longer be sated and a flame was lit in Tunisia which spread throughout the Arab reason. Administrators, politicians, institutional governors saw the visceral consequence of the systemic failure to address corruption and no such figure could and will ever again be able to assume that endemic corruption could be continued with the impunity and without public protest. So across the Arab world, new approaches and responses are being sought. And it is to Qatar, with its robust 
and vigorous approach to anti-corruption to which many in the region are looking. The first Arab Forum on Asset Recovery took place in Doha between the 11th and 14th of September of last year, organized under the auspices of the G8 Dofield Partnership, bringing together senior politicians, legal practitioners from across the Arab world with delegations from the G8 countries and, and at which the Emir of Qatar gave the QNAT address. Now the forum made clear that the return of stolen assets um, was an imperative to those countries who were struggling after the Arab Spring, and that that return would make a real impact on the economies in the region, and that success was dependent on international cooperation. But what was equally clear was that the era of impunity was really over. More effective mechanisms were required, quicker processing of lawsuits, better cooperation between judicial bodies, more judges and prosecutors working on cases together, and universal implementation of the UN Convention Against Corruption. It was also clear from the earlier conference on corruption, which took place between the 4th and 6th of May in Qatar, that there was a need for a global, agreed definition of corruption. And the international community was really, through that and other conferences, getting there. There was a coalescence around the framework created by the United Kingdom within the Bribery Act of 2010, incorporating as it does the essence of current best practice. I chaired the opening session of that conference and it was clear to me that the world was at a tipping point. Agreement was no longer simply an option. It was a necessity. If global law enforcement agencies were to have any real hope of competing with the fraudsters and the purveyors of corrupt practices and winning. The message from the Doha Forum and the Rule of Law Conference was plain. It will take all of us working together to succeed. And the territories thus have more to gain from this changed world order than they stand to lose. The Bribery Act of 2010, which has recently come into force in England and Wales, is increasingly, as I've mentioned, being recognized as the gold standard for anti-corruption legislation. And the territories are well placed, given the historic and legal ties with the United Kingdom, to exploit the benefits which the Bribery Act can bring in terms of increasing international investor confidence. Alongside this, I believe that it may be possible to create a positive incentive to implement adequate procedures to promote best practice and to prevent, or at the very least, create an environment which is hostile to corruption. In my view, it should be possible for us to create an internationally accepted system of kite marks which countries and companies can adopt in order to meet agreed international standards of probity, giving reassurance to investors that those with whom they deal are adhering to best available practice, which will militate against the payment of the corruption tax. The territories can, and in my view, should lead the way in this. Now, I know that time is pressing, and I have uh, further um, explanations in relation to how the Bribery Act works, and indeed the different commissions who have implemented processes. But I just want to get um, a little showing of hands as to how many of you would like me to go through what the Bribery Act says. Because what I think I could do is when this speech in due course is printed, I could just put it in there. 
Show of hands. I'll take that as assent. If I can just um, mention very briefly then why the Bribery Act is so unusual. One, it deals not only with those who seek to bribe, but those who are bribed. Two, it places for the first time a duty on companies and institutions to have adequate procedures so that they can create an environment which is hostile to corruption, and that is a dramatic departure. Each anti-corruption commission which has succeeded, has succeeded as a result of clear, clear commitment from the governments who have set them up. And usually, each of the anti-corruption commissions have been set up because there was a scandal which caused them to be created. We saw that after Watergate. We saw that in Hong Kong after it was discovered that the bureaucracy in Hong Kong was corrupt. And we saw that again in Singapore. But there are a number of features which are really important for anti-corruption commissions to have. Independence, rigor, funding, expertise. Those elements are critical if anti-corruption commissions are to do their work. But in my view, we should never substitute our own rigor and vigor and replace it simply with a commission. A commission will only be as good as we make it. If we don't cr create instruments, if we don't give them the funding, if we don't give them the power, if we don't enable them to monitor the situation, then they will be forgiven for not making a difference. I believe. I believe that change is possible. But change will only be possible if we create that change. We have an opportunity to do that. I genuinely hope that we will. It is not a dream. It is, I believe, a reality. My central proposal in relation to the creation of the international kite mark, which would make any country and company which holds the kite mark adhere to agreed international standards, is, I think, one of the ways forwards. We always hear people say, well, I would like to be straight. I would like to be honest, but no one else is. You have to understand the realities of business. I think we can create a new paradigm where the advantage will rest with those of us who are honest and straight because we will set a benchmark which says you cannot play in our market unless you adhere to the highest possible standards and thereby creating a positive incentive for compliance as opposed to a disincentive, which tragically so many people believe adherence to the rule of law currently is. The United uh, Kingdom is making a step forward. The EU has gone part of the way to establishing a form of kite mark system under the public procurement directive. Because as many of you will know, any tenderer for a public contract is excluded from participation in that contract if they have been subject to a conviction for a specified offense. But I think we can go further. Because as I've said, there are huge incentives for territories in being seen as a global leader on these issues, not least in the attractiveness of the territories for investors. And the territories have a route into Europe, 
via the United Kingdom, which the territories apart from many of their neighbors, particularly in the Caribbean. And the Overseas Association decision made under part four of the treaty on the functioning of the EU governs the relationship between the territories and the EU. The African continent is also looking for partners, looking for partners in whom they can trust. So the opportunities are there. I hope those opportunities will be seized. The events surrounding the G8 demonstrates the risk of not taking advantage of opportunities when they arrive. Corruption cannot be allowed to prevail. If it does, our democracies will fail. It will corrode and eventually stifle innovation and creativity. The desire to succeed based on individuals' own intrinsic merit, hard work and application, belief that an individual or a group working together can make a difference, has to be supported. Risk and reward have to be tied back together, the new partnership model. Market forces can work to separate risk from reward, and sometimes that separation can generate a, time, a type of vicious downward cycle in the economy. Now, we need to create a virtuous, uplifting cycle so that ethics and law work together to enable us to avoid future crises as those we saw across markets in 2008. There are many things for us to fix. Not all of them are easy nor straightforward. But I genuinely believe together we can, if we choose, make a difference and help to ensure the pervasive nature and cost of corruption is part of our past and not our future. I hope the change will start with us and the change will start tonight. Uh, I very much thank you for listening and I hope that we will now be able to have a really good interactive conversation. Thank you very much. And if anyone knows how to fix these spectacles, I'll be really grateful. Ladies and gentlemen, the Baroness has consented to entertain five brief, emphasis on brief questions. So if there are any persons in the audience who would so wish to pose a question, we would entertain them at this time. If you just raise your hand, please. Someone will bring you the mic.
the Anti-Corruption Commission has been successful after somebody has created a scandal. Then so probably you answer my question before I talk. And that is the reason why I decide being one of the very first in try to make a question, then so made a scandal. And I would like to advise you that in this country, for example, uh, what is, like you say, uh, the fifth financial center in the world, I think uh, the terror insurance center, we have a large incident with the HBSC bank a, a few months ago, a year ago, something like that. Uh, but that's, that's not only nothing. For example, the, the society, the people like me, the people that work, all right, are absolutely unprotected even when the United Kingdom government has tried to create and pass Bill of Rights, we are still totally unprotected. And here is no human rights. And the corruption is still plaguing every single office on this country. And I don't know what is going to be about to me tomorrow because creating the scandal right here. So I don't want to go in any particular uh, issue just to be decent and that I don't want nobody feeling that this is a personal thing. It's just something that I want to address to you and very specific to the Foreign Commonwealth Office. I, I, I think that you are still having certain connections up there and it's going to be helpful. We need to use all, we need to use all the tools uh, it to be simple, let me say this. In this country, I was carried by the Royal Cayman Island Police to a psychiatry with a court orders. And I have no and Excuse me, sir. Have you, have, I think that you've had enough time to have framed your question. Thank you. Well, well firstly, can I, um, can I say that one of the things that has happened very clearly is that there is now a very... Uh, international understanding that corruption is corrosive and it undermines democracies and eventually the public will vote with their feet and with their voices and actually if we want change then I believe that Gandhi was right we have to be the change we want to see in the world and it has to start with each of us I think so many of us wait around for someone to do something. Someone has to start. Well, I was always brought up to believe that it has to start with me. I have to walk, and I hope that others will walk with me. And I always remember Rosa Parks, because if you can think back to what the southern states of America were like. Here was a poor, not well-educated, black, middle-aged woman who everybody said had no power. And the day she was asked to go to the buck of the bus, basically, forgive me, she said, hell no, hell no. I will never get on your bus again. And she started to walk, and she walked on her own. But look around. Within a very short time, others walked with her. And she created a tsunami which changed the face of America. And we now have a black man in the White House.
So I think that demonstrates that change is possible. And I'll never forget, I was in a reception in the House of Lords on the day that President Obama was elected. And I was talking to two widows of Northern Irish Protestant uh, police officers. They had a reception. And one of the ladies turned to me and said, isn't this the most wonderful day? And I thought she was referring to the fact that for once the sun was shining in London and we were in the House of Lords. And I said, yes, isn't it a wonderful day? And then she turned to me as if I was a simpleton, which of course I am, and she said, no, dear. I was talking about the fact that President Obama has been elected. If that can happen in America, perhaps we too can have peace in Northern Ireland. Hope, hope. So I really do think that each of us has so much more power than we recognize. And if we want to change, then let's start tonight. Let's be the change that will radically change each of our countries. And let's start with Cayman. Good evening. Hi, everyone. Good evening, Brian and Scott. Thank you so much for your informative and very important and timely speech. Uh, thank you to CCI and President Gordon for putting together this lecture series as well. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I guess my question kind of stems from your answer as well. Uh, you touched on international standards, uh, UN conventions, as well as various <coughs> acts, such as the Bribery Act of 2010. However, my question is more um, in terms of a smaller scale or a local query. Uh, in terms of overseas territories growing rapidly, uh, in terms of economic and technological growth that you touched on, the offshoot to me seems to be a very materialistic society that equates success with monetary gain um, or profit. I think Kimai is included as well. Um, however, in addition to the judiciary and police enforcement techniques that you spoke about, uh, do you have an opinion on any social or cultural practices that can assist uh, in the mitigation efforts to stem corruption here in Cayman um, in terms of the public and private sector? Thank you. I think um, what I believe, as I said in um, my speech, is that this is a multifaceted, multi-layered issue. And the most important thing for each of us to do is to not think that combating corruption is somebody else's business. And it's those of us who close our eyes and say nothing, who are as complicit as those who actually commit the corrupt acts, because we aren't making the difference. And I think it's really important for us to create a system where the default position is that we disclose and we challenge and we don't accept. But it means that we have to be clear about our own actions because corruption can start at many different levels. It can be the vehicle which deprives and depresses a person who is not advantaged from reaching their true potential. There are those who think, I can only go to a certain school if I have a certain name, if I belong to a certain strata of society. I will only get the scholarship if I am in that group. If I don't get the scholarship, I won't get preferment and I won't get the jobs because the jobs aren't really open to everyone. They're open to those who are already in the know. So I think we need to understand that corruption eats away at the very fabric of our societies. All of us now are living in a world where geographical location is no longer the determining factor of our future. And therefore, each country 
needs to exploit the talents of every single member of their community if they are to survive and thrive. So for example, that means you cannot ignore the talent of 50% of your population who happens to be female. Because if you do that, you deprive yourself of an opportunity of real richness. So I do think that we each are contributors to the communities in which we live. And if we see things which we don't like, then start to think, how can I change that? What can I do? Instead of saying, why doesn't someone do this for me? I think the change starts with us. Good evening, Dr. Scott, and thank you for your insightful lecture. My question is in relation to the creation of independent missions and um, their independence. In 2009, the Cayman Islands had a very um, dramatic change to our constitutional landscape. We introduced new features called the institutions that support democracy, which include, include constitutional commissions like the Human Rights Commission, Standards of Public Life, um, and other um, organizations under that umbrella. Non-constitutional body would be the Anti-Corruption Commission. Now, four years have gone by, and it would be a pair as though there's been a false start or a failure to launch in most of these institutions that support democracy. And what appears to be one of the fundamental problems is that the question of independence, not just through their who's overseeing them, but certainly the funding that they receive. At present, most well, 100% of the funding of these commissions comes directly from government general revenue. But it does not appear as though the commissions themselves have the authority to dictate the level of funding they need. Um, I believe that these are still managed by the public sector generally, and the direction as to how much funding they receive is dictated by others than the commission members themselves, and also not including the LA. I know that in other jurisdictions like Trinidad and Tobago, the Integrity Commission has a means by which that commission can put forward its budget and that cannot be altered by a cabinet. It is up for debate in the Legislative Assembly and the Legislative Assembly is the one that um, as ascribes the amount of budget we have annually. I would like for you, if you are in a position to do so, to provide us with some information as to how such commissions can achieve independence, not just in name or in law, but in reality. Thank you. Well, I think, as you know, um, the, uh, the government is considering even now how to structure the funding for the commission and how to implement this. And you now have the benefit of a new government who appears to be committed to looking at these issues not only favorably but energetically. I think there is a huge opportunity to look at other commissions which have worked successfully. Uh, the conference that's going to be held later which will look at these issues I'm sure will be able to go into greater depth. In the remarks that I was going to make I set out the nature and the extent of the provision that's made for both Singapore and Hong Kong as an example. But there are other commissions who've worked well and there are commissions who have worked less well. So I am very much going to watch this space. Um, I'm wishing you well, but you do know that as a citizen, you have an ability to put a pin on every minister's chair so they can't sit down very comfortably until they deal with it.
got a pleasure to have you with us here on the Trinity. Regarding the corruption, let us say we have corruption in the island, and there may be several individuals in a group that support one another in their corruption in the island here. And any time you try to get through something, they sweep it under the carpet. Now, if these things are done in the name of the Queen, we go to the government, but he may be influenced by people in society he considers uh, intellectual and leaders in the community. Where can we go to England if we cannot get the support we need in Cayman because of the groups that look out for one another in the corruption? Well, I think one of the, firstly, thank you very much for your question, Mr. Christian. It's good to see you here. I think one of the most important instruments that you have right here in Cayman is the judiciary. The judiciary is the final port of call for those who wish to secure justice. And the opportunity to review decisions made by institutions, to challenge decisions made by those who wish to act corruptly, in the final analysis, go to the court for the court to determine. And I know from talking to many investors across the world that one of the things that they value most highly about the United Kingdom and most highly about the overseas territories is the high quality of your judiciary. And the judiciary are seen in this jurisdiction as some of the very best and indeed one of the benefits that the Cayman and a number of other overseas territories have is you don't only have um, homegrown wonderful Caribbean judges but you have been able to benefit too from the judges who are pre have previously been resident in the United Kingdom have previously been some of our highest um, judges in our country in the UK who now come to assist in uh, the judiciary here. And I am very um, delighted that two of the luminaries from the bench are sitting right there in front of me. Before I ask my, my question, I would just like to say that uh, on behalf of the PBM led administration, that we are committed to, to fighting against corruption and giving the support that is necessary for that. Safe to say that about myself and my colleagues. But the question was would you say that public prosecution and attention to those involved in corruption is also a key tool to fighting against corruption? If so, how? And please give examples of this in other anti corruption regulation legislation. Well, um, as I've said, the most effective way of addressing those who are involved in criminal activity or corruption is through detection, prosecution, and then successful application for asset recovery. The Proceeds of Crime Act in our country has been very successful. It enables prosecutors to work in collaboration with their international interlocutors, collecting evidence from wherever it can be culled in order to bring criminals and those who engage in corruption to book. That's why when I was talking about um, the tools, I think you can't just look at um, the anti-corruption commissions. You have to look at what are we doing to educate business to participate in the detection of crime, particularly fraud, particularly corrupt practices. How are we skilling our prosecutors and training them so they have the acuity and judgment to make the assessment as to whether the acts complained of are legitimate or unlawful? Do we have sufficiently highly skilled, highly trained members of the judiciary who are able to adjudicate successfully and fairly upon those matters when they come before the court? Can assets 
which have been improperly and illegally acquired been, be therefore withdrawn and withheld from the criminal fraternity. All those issues are important. If you look at the criminal, there are two things that the criminal fears most. One is detection, because if they feel the likelihood of them being detected is remote, then they will feel comfortable in continuing with their corrupt acts and their illegal activity. The second is the assets that they acquire as a result of the corrupt or illegal activity. And it is also status. So if you are able to increase the likelihood of interdiction, which is going to lead to prosecution and conviction, and you then relieve them, as I said earlier, of the burden of their weighty assets. You make it possible that they do the risk assessment for themselves and end up thinking this crime simply isn't worth it. Firstly, I go through all the effort to do it. Secondly, I acquire all this stuff. And thirdly, they strip me of it and send me to prison. Those odds are not odds the criminal likes. But I do think that prosecutors have to do what we are now doing, and that is working together internationally. You have Europol, Eurojust, FATA, all these international groups now able to share information in a way makes interdiction internationally and globally more possible than it was in the past. Unfortunately, crime is no longer local, it's no longer regional, it's no longer international. The norm now is for criminals to act globally. And that's why it takes all of us working together to fight them. I've said in the past, that they have the conspiracy of the criminal. We now to create, need to create our own conspiracy, but it's the conspiracy of the just. And we need to be a jolly sight better than they are. Ladies and gentlemen, my job is perhaps the most difficult of the evening to bring the vote of thanks. And so first of all, Baroness Scotland, I would like to express on behalf of the Board of Governors to Universal College and might I say this rapt audience, our great appreciation for the enlightenment and challenge which you have brought to us in your lecture. I, if I would take the liberty to encapsulate, I would just like to reiterate what I gathered, that the responsibility is for all of us to act, to form our own conspiracy of the just. And while it is good to have an anti-corruption commission, we should not rely completely on our anti-corruption commission. Each of us, as a citizen, an honest citizen, has a responsibility. I often think on these occasions of the Irish statesman, Edmund Burke, who's one of my favorites. And he said, all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is for men of goodwill to do nothing. So if we sit back and do nothing, then corruption will flourish in our society. But if we take responsibility, then we will put up a good fight and snap it up. So thank you for reminding us of our responsibility, Baroness Scotland. I would also like to thank Dr. Livingston and his organizing committee and I
publicly and shamelessly announce that I'm a hard taskmaster. I drive my charges hard, but they also know that I'm gracious and just in acknowledging their efforts. And so I would publicly acknowledge the efforts of these people who tirelessly put up with me and still give of their best. Let's give them a rousing round. But ladies and gentlemen, my most lavish and extravagant appreciation goes to you, the audience, who came out this evening to hear this lecture and who, by your very presence here, indicates to us that you are soldiers on the front line of this anti-corruption drive. And so I bid you stay tuned, stay interested, and please do support us as we continue with the final distinguished lecture in November and then the conference the 19th to the 21st of March 2014. I invite you after my brief presentation to Baroness Scotland to join us for cocktails on the other, other side of the hall. And when you are true, through, I bid you a good evening and thanks again for coming. And now I have a presentation to make to Baroness Scotland. Baroness Scotland, it would be remiss of us at the University College if we would let you go away without giving you a small token of our appreciation. Dr. Livingston, who is also the public orator of the university, remarked that while we focus on scholarship and good teaching, we are also getting into research and writing. And so in this bag are some of the efforts of our university faculties in their writing. We hope that you find time to read it and digest it, and you may even be so disposed to offer us some comments on what you have read. And so please accept on behalf of the University College this small token of our appreciation for the wonderful lecture you have delivered this evening. Can I just um, say how uh, pleased I am to have been given this opportunity and thank you all very much indeed for receiving me so graciously. And I hope that after this lecture, each of us will think of three things that we will do as a result of coming that we would not have done had we not come. And I hope, gentlemen, that you will do at least one of them. Ladies, be free to do 10. <laughs>